The main components for successful desert hiking are you, your food and water, your equipment, and your technique. Let's start with you. There's no substitute for overall fitness. This doesn't mean that you need to be a triathlete, but nothing will prepare you better for desert hiking than desert hiking. Start slow and easy, then build up over time. Trying to do too much too soon will result in an uncomfortable and possibly unsafe hike. Although walking or running on a treadmill certainly will build your aerobic capacity and improve your fitness, walking on a rocky or sandy trail is very different. Don't overestimate your trail fitness until you've done some actual trail hiking. You can acclimatize to heat. The fastest and most effective way to do so is a bit intimidating. Go out in hot weather for five consecutive days, spending several hours each day doing things that make you perspire. Since most of us can't or don't want to do such full immersion conditioning, the alternative is to be outside frequently as it gets hotter, doing easy hikes first and gradually extending them as you feel comfortable doing so. Now let's talk about your food and water. Assuming you're generally fit and have acclimatized to the heat as much as possible, your personal performance depends primarily on food, water, and technique. I'll talk about technique later. The main problem with food and water is that it's difficult to tell when you need some. So don't base your consumption decisions on when you feel hungry or feel thirsty. Instead, assume that for most of our hiking, moderate loads at moderate speeds on moderate trails in moderate temperatures, you'll need 100 to 200 calories per hour of food and one half to one liter per hour of water. Figure at the higher end of these ranges as the load and speed increase on strenuous trails and in hot weather. Remember that when you wake up in the morning, you're already dehydrated and short of calories. Before you even reach the trail, you should rehydrate with at least a liter of fluid and restock your energy stores with at least a few hundred calories of food. On the trail, the thing to remember is every 30 minutes, eat a little and drink a lot. If you didn't hydrate and eat before starting, you'll need to eat and drink more near the beginning of your hike. Food not only provides the calories your body needs when you hike, it also provides necessary electrolytes like sodium and potassium that are lost as you perspire. Most trail snacks provide adequate electrolytes, but some people supplement snacks with electrolyte replacement mixes or sports drinks. Keep in mind that many of these mostly are sugar. If you use these mixes or sports drinks, dilute them before use. Don't drink them straight. They can temporarily dehydrate you and even cause muscle cramps. Let's turn to your equipment. You've probably heard of the so-called 10 equipment essentials, which I won't repeat. Just Google the phrase and you'll get several generally similar versions of the list. Instead, let's talk about things that often aren't on the list but that are just as important for successful hiking in the preserve and similar environments. The single most important thing everyone needs is somebody who knows where you're going and when you should be back, even if it's on a trail you hike regularly. You also should hike with a companion. 
Only hike alone on trails where you know there are plenty of other people around who could help if necessary. Carry a fully charged cell phone and turn it on. It's your single most important piece of emergency gear. Carry extra food and water. It's good exercise, it's an insurance policy for you, and it might enable you to help somebody else who wasn't as well prepared as you are. Carry a comb and small pliers or tweezers to deal with thorny flora. If you don't need them, maybe somebody else on the trail will. Duct tape is a miracle product that can be used for everything from preventing blisters to holding together torn boots to taping sprains. And it's especially easy to carry if you use hiking poles. Just wind a few feet of tape around the shaft of each pole. Speaking of poles, if you hike with people who hike a lot, you'll notice that most of them use hiking poles. Using poles gives you a better workout by involving your upper body and lets you set a faster pace uphill and down by improving your balance and relieving knee stress. Poles also are extremely versatile pieces of safety equipment. Combined with the duct tape wrapped around them, you can use them for all sorts of things. Use the right pack. Fanny packs are more popular than they deserve to be. Fanny packs typically have limited capacity for food, water, and emergency gear. They're not comfortable when they get heavy since they buckle across your stomach rather than your hips. Instead, get and use a decent quality, medium capacity day pack with a built-in hydration bladder and drinking tube. The easier it is to drink, the more likely you are to do so. And the easier it is to carry the stuff you should, the more likely you are to actually bring it. We tell members of the public who hike with us to wear sturdy shoes, sunscreen, and a hat. We should set a good example by doing the same. Finally, let's talk about your technique. You can be fit, you can be well hydrated and well fed, and you can be using all the right stuff and still have a lousy, tiring, even dangerous hike if you use poor technique. Almost anybody can do almost anything if they do it at the right speed. I've seen people with mediocre fitness finish challenging treks and climbs at a slow but steady speed. Think of your speed as your pace, steps per minute, multiplied by your stride length. In other words, your speed equals steps per minute times the length of each step. With that in mind, successful hiking involves maintaining a reasonably steady pace, steps per minute, while adjusting your stride length to fit the trail conditions. Pace is important because it gives your whole body a tempo, and with a little practice, you can synchronize your breathing to that tempo, in other words, to your pace. You may find that most of the time you breathe once every six paces, or every four paces, or when the going gets tough, maybe even every other step. But whatever the relationship, this synchronization lets you establish a rhythm that you can continue indefinitely and comfortably. What helps make this rhythm possible is adjusting your stride length to reflect trail conditions, especially slope, without changing your pace. When you're on a level or downhill section, lengthen your stride and your speed, which remember is your pace times your stride, increases without changing your pace or your breathing. When you're going uphill, 
shorten your stride while maintaining your pace, you'll naturally slow down, reflecting the harder work going uphill. Taking big steps up, whether walking up a steep trail section or clambering over rocks in the trail, is extremely tiring. Your muscles use more energy raising your body one big step than several equivalent small ones. On a steep trail, it's more efficient and therefore less tiring to take baby steps rather than to take aggressive strides uphill. Above all, don't set a speed that you can't sustain. Starting and stopping repeatedly to catch your breath is very hard on your cardiovascular system and can be dangerous. It's like repeatedly giving yourself a cardiac stress test, but without a doctor nearby to watch you. Stopping repeatedly is a clear sign that your speed is too fast for your current aerobic capacity and the specific conditions on the trail. Maybe your pace is too quick or your stride length is too long, but something needs to change. A way to think about what's the right speed for you is that it's the speed which, if you had enough food and water, you could sustain indefinitely or until you have to go to the bathroom, get to the end of the trail, you get the idea. Get yourself, your food and water, your equipment, and your technique right, and you'll go a long way toward ensuring a safe and pleasant hiking experience.